Stars and Birds on episode 447 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane and Dave Chapman is back joining us today as well. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the night sky and this podcast is for everybody who loves going out under the stars. So just as a, a quick note before we uh, jump in, uh, Dave, my apolo- I'm not going to do a big introduction for you. Okay. I hope that's okay because... Uh, I'll just say hi, everybody, and I'm glad to be back. So, yeah, if people want to know you're almost one of the, 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 you know, one of the core employees now of uh, actual astronomy, joining Chris and I. (laughs) Oh, shucks. We'll we'll put him on the payroll. Your, uh, I want double, I I want double your, uh, your pay, Chris. (laughs) We'll we'll give you triple. (laughs) Triple. (laughs) Triple. It'd be a a double, double, extra large. Um, and real quick, Dave, um, you're going to talk about stars and birds, uh, in particular, uh, celestial birds, lore and observing. Yeah. And, uh, as part of this, you've actually got a PDF presentation with some, uh, with some really cool graphics and visual that's available via uh, your Dropbox. And I think we're going to make that link, uh, available for, for people to download in the show notes. Thank you. Awesome. Very cool. So, uh, stars and birds, who'd have thunk it? Uh, where do you want to start here, Dave? Well, maybe I'll just give a little background. Oh, you know, why did I even do this? Uh, and it goes back a couple of years. We were getting ready for Nova East in 2023, which eventually got canceled because of the severe flooding of our site. And Nova uh, East is the annual oh, it, star party uh, get together of visual observers. Uh, down in Nova Scotia. Yeah, Canada. well, we have. Yeah. yeah, it's our. It's the Halifax Center's annual star party, the longest running star party in Atlantic Canada. And uh, we have. Yeah, we do observing, and we we do astro imaging, and we have talks, and and uh, we have a lot of different activities. It's our major social event, actually, for the center for the year. We mostly just hang out, you know, and and socialize. So because it's cloudy most of the time. <laughs> So uh, so the idea was we were trying to come up with a theme, and we have a lot of people in our club who are avid birders, you know, like Pat Kelly, and there was a guy, Jason Dane, and, and I said, hey, why don't we do why don't we do like a star and bird thing? So we'll do some like we'll get Jason to talk about some of his bird photography and uh and uh, and I said, and then, and I think there's some bird constellations, you know, that we can talk about. Well, in the end that got cancelled. Jason gave his talk at a center meeting and then we came around to this year and they were saying, well, what's the the theme going to be? And, you know, what about the t-shirt? And I said, well, look, you know, we had it all set up for last year. Why don't we just go with that again and call it stars and birds, just change the date to 24. And so they went for it. And so I was on the hook then to give the, to give a talk on celestial birds. Cause I said, Mm -hmm. I had started working on it last year about, so the idea is that I was going to go through the sky and talk about all the constellations. Well, not all the constellations, but many constellations that involve birds. And that's what, it's It's very simple. There's nothing deep here. Mm-hmm. So uh, we can just, we can just uh, go forward. And uh, so for those people who are looking at the, um, at the um, PDF version of the talk, there's a design there which was the, our T-shirt design. I'm actually wearing it today, but you can't see it. Take my word for it. So uh, so there's a design there. It shows Cygnus, and it shows Aquila, and it shows Lyra. And you're going to ask me, well, what's that got to do with birds? And that's what the cool part of this talk is, is what has Lyra got to do with birds? So I'm just going to s- start off by... Um, there's there's basically two parts to this uh, story. Uh, part one is deals with the uh, uh, the constellations that the official constellations that uh, the International Astronomical Union def- defined in 1938. Uh, so there's 88 official constellations, and uh, of course these are based on you know the Babylonian, Grecian, and Roman myths. And then when the Europeans went into the Southern Hemisphere, they expanded those constellations. And of those 88, there are nine celestial birds and one which I call honorable mention. 
Now, what I've said so far is very Eurocentric, very Western. Okay. Uh, so part two, I don't, I don't have a lot of material on this, but I just want to acknowledge that, that, you know, there are many cultures uh, around the world and there's, there's a lot of indigenous constellations uh, that derive from other cultures. So I will say a few words about a Mi'kmaq story called Muin and the Seven Bird Hunters, because that comes from around these parts here in Halifax. And there's a couple of other things. Uh, there's some Cree constellations. And there's also a really cool bird constellation from New Zealand, uh, the the Maori that that I'll finish off with. So, um, so moving on to the uh, IAU constellations, uh, what I'm going to do is is uh, I'm going to list them off here with their Latin name and their English name, and I've ordered them by declination. So for us northern uh, viewers. Uh, so the ones that are the, at the top of the list are the most easy to observe. And then as you get down to the bottom of the list, they become more difficult to observe, if not impossible, from Canada. Okay. So the top of the list it would be Cygnus, the swan. It's around 45 degrees north. Everyone knows Cygnus. The second one is Lyra, the harp, which is at 35 degrees north. And this is the honorable mention because, as I will explain, the story of the harp is wrapped up with a vulture or perhaps a, an eagle. Uh, uh, and that connection seems to have been lost in, in recent uh, years. And nobody seems to know about it, but it was quite common uh, years ago. So we'll talk about that. Now, Aquila, or Aquila, Aquila, the eagle, uh, is on the equator. Uh, it never occurred to me that Aquila was on the equator, but that's where it is. It's kind of on the equator just like Orion is, so it's kind of halfway up the sky from, from where I observe. Then you get a bit lower in the sky. Now, those first three are all in the summer. The next two are sort of winter and spring uh, uh, constellations. So Corvus the crow is a spring constellation at minus 20 degrees declination. And then the next one is Columba the dove at minus 35 degrees. Uh, it's it's pretty low on the horizon. Uh, you have to you know make sure you're at a time of the year that it culminates. And even then it's a bit it's a bit hard to see and it's kind of inconspicuous. I can't say that I'm very familiar with that constellation. I don't even know. If you guys out there in Saskatchewan would ever be able to see that or, or not. So do you have any impression of Columba, Chris or Shane? Yeah, yeah, the Columba the Dove. Yeah. Yeah, I've observed it from here. Uh okay. definitely need to get a, a pretty good uh southern horizon. But yeah, what is it? There's uh there's a globular cluster there or something. It's like NGC two four. Well, we'll get into the we'll get into that when we get to that part of the story, okay? This is just the intro. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm going to go through them in, in some detail. Not not a huge amount of detail. I'm going to go through each of these constellations. I'm not just going to list them. Okay, so the it's, next... Okay, never mind. So we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Hold I'm on. I'm just excited. I'm just <laughs> I know excited. you are. <laughs> so the next... One, two, three, four, five. The next five are <clears throat> basically invisible from Canada. And they're, they're, I'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, Grus or Grus, the crane at minus 45. The phoenix, which is called the phoenix in English too, minus 50 degrees. Now that's a mythological bird. Then there's the tucana, which is the toucan at minus 65 degrees. Pavo, the peacock, at minus 65 degrees also. And the last one is Apus, the bird of paradise, minus 75 degrees. I'm not actually sure if that's a real bird or not. So I don't know if either of you have any knowledge about the bird of paradise. Is that a made up? I don't. No, I have to look that not up. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it could be a mythological or it might be the real thing. I know there's a flower called that, the bird of flower. Anyway, that's worth looking into. I didn't spend a lot of time on these because they're not ones that we can view easily from home. 
all of our listeners in the Southern Hemisphere are probably grinding their teeth at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and we do. We have lots. So, uh... <laughs> well, yeah. Well, maybe somebody can uh, come back and do a follow up and say, "Here's here's the cool things about these constellations." Anyway, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so I. And this is this list that I put together, this talk that I gave at Nova East just a few weeks ago. I wanted it to be very much about observing, like not just the lore and the names, but what could you see in them? And it turns out that there's a fair number of objects uh, in the, certainly the summer stars that are in Explore the Universe, the RESC's Beginner Observing Program. So, mm -hmm. for instance, well, for a start, the constellations themselves, Cygnus, Lyra, Aquila, and and their principal stars are, are in the Explore the Universe. So, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. But also, uh, in Cygnus, we have Beta Cygnus Alberio, which is a colored double star, beautiful colored double star, visible in binoculars. There's also a cool a triple star, Omicron 1 Cygni, and a double star, 16 Cygni. So these are all in Explore the Universe. In Lyra, there are three double stars. There's the double-double multiple star, Epsilon Lyra, Epsilon Lyra. Mind you, you can't see the second part of the double in binoculars. You need a telescope for that. But you can see the the, the two main stars easily. And then mm -hmm. Zeta Lyra is a double star and Delta Lyra is a double star. So in Lyra, there's three double stars that are in Explore the Universe. And actually, there's not a whole lot in Aquila in terms of uh, uh, things in the RESC observing list. Uh, it's kind of bereft, I would say. Uh, I don't know if there's any, any, anything else of interest in there. So, uh, of course, Deneb, Altair, Vega uh, are the summer triangle. So that's kind of cool. And I'm going to show you soon or tell you soon about how they're all involved with stars. So, And, of course, around these parts, uh, Deneb, Altair, and Vega, if you take the letters from Deneb, Altair, and Vega, the starting letters, you get Dave. So we call that the <laughs> constellation Dave. <laughs> and you, you might you might object you might object that uh, Vega uh, has two letters and I'm, I'm I'm kind of pushing it but but Lyra it's the double double so we're allowed we're allowed to have two letters from Vega Dave <laughs> I, I can I can see Bill we are smashing himself in the forehead <laughs> yeah well we had a we had a little movement when Quinn Smith was in around he he's up he's back in England now but. He, he was saying that he had this idea where we were going to rename Lyra. We were going to go to Tim Hortons and we were going to, we were going to offer to rebrand Lyra as uh, Tim Hortons constellation on the basis of it, having a donut and a double, double. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great idea. I don't know why we didn't follow it up, but we figured we could get a couple of mil, you know, from that. And then maybe like build an observatory or something. <laughs> A constellation, Tim Horton. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we make people laugh at star parties with stories like sometimes. that. Sometimes. So, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> okay, let's get into depth here, uh, Cygnus and Swan. Uh, Cygnus, there's a couple of different legends. Often in Greek myths, you'll see multiple legends and multiple versions of uh, legends. So Cygnus is obviously a swan. And one of the legends is actually about two uh, uh, two lovers, sickness, 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 and Python. I don't really know that story, but it's like two two star-crossed lovers, if you like, and they ended and and uh, their love is unrequited, and they ended up end up getting put into the sky. I don't know that one, but I just wanted to mention that there is another one out there. The more common one is the story of uh, Leda and the swan. And this is a typical, you know, Zeus, king of the gods uh, story. He, he he was kind of a randy uh, king of the gods, Zeus, and he liked to transform himself into different things, uh, birds, animals, different things. So he, he, he was after Leda 
And so he transformed himself into a swan and uh, uh, had his merry way with her. Uh, so there's a, this is a the more well known story in classical literature, and you, there's even paintings and that sort of thing, statues in classic art of of Leda and the Swan. But I mean, it does. I mean, when you trace out the stars in the sky, I mean, it it has a very prominent uh, feature. I mean, it, uh, the main stars. Of course, uh, sometimes called the Northern Cross, and uh, um, but then there's other stars which represent the wings. So, uh, so Deneb is the primary star, um, and that means uh, the tail. There's other stars in the sky called Deneb, like um, Deneb Katos, which is in Cetus. Mm -hmm. One of the stars there is called Deneb. There's other stars with the word Deneb, and it means tail. Yeah, isn't right? there one in like northern Ophiuchus or? Yeah, there's probably a, a like Ophiuchus is uh, the snake charmer or the snake yeah. holder. So there may be a star there named Deneb, uh, meaning the tail of the snake. So, but Deneb all by itself is Deneb the tale of the swan and then of course alberio is the i mean so the 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 long arm of the cross is the neck of the swan and at the end you have alberio and i don't think that means anything um i tried to figure out what the meaning of that word was mm -hmm. but but i think it was basically represents the beak but it's not a a, a, a translation or or so sometimes these words get uh, corrupted from the um, Arabic, like al. There's a lot of words beginning with al, which means the in Ar Ar Arabic. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyhow, it's pretty hard to trace these things down. But in effect, it's the beak of the swan. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's a beautiful colored double star. It's a crowd pleaser at star parties in the summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you can see that in a small telescope. How how, how do you guys view it? Have, do you usually check it out when you go observing? Jane? Mm -hmm. Now and then. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like an always, but um, yeah, occasionally. How about you, Chris? I'm, I'm pretty rare on that one, I got to admit. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're a bit tired of it, are you? Well, we, we'll, mostly deep sky objects for me, sadly. We, we like to show it to to folks because it's it's bright and obvious and the other yeah. fun thing you can do is you, you let people look at it and this is interesting because it's it's how people look they'll look in it and you and they'll say oh that's nice and then you go well do you see any colors yeah and they go and they go oh oh yeah there's colors <laughs> and then you ask them and then you ask them what colors they see and then you get all kinds of different answers right mm. but some people look in and they see that right away and they say oh look at the colors but other people you have to kind of suggest it to them because they're not mm. really but you never know what people are seeing you know you don't know if it's quite in focus or it's hard to know what people see when they put their eye up to to the eyepiece so i always have fun uh, with that one mm -hmm. so omicron one signi is a nice triple star that's in the wing of uh the, I would say like I would call it the should I call it the western wing the, the western wing of um the swan uh it's a nice binocular object looks great in a telescope mm -hmm. uh some people struggle with it uh, in ETU, I think it's because there's another star, uh, Omicron 2, and I think some people think that Omicron 2 is part of the double, but that's not true. Omicron 1 is a triple star all by itself. Mm. So it's a little bit of a tricky one. Um, there is a Messier object in there, uh, M39, which is uh, uh, up the other end. The <laughs> The R sand of her, as we'd say, mm. here. <laughs> almost in Lesserta. Uh, so there's a nice, a lovely uh, open cluster there. I don't think there's too many other M objects. Uh, there's a lot of NGC objects in Cygnus, mm -hmm. but for Messier, there's only the 39. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll just rhyme off a few of the, the popular ones. Uh, the North American Nebula, of course, which is quite close to Dineb. 
NGC 7000, and of course the Veil Nebula, mm -hmm. uh, two parts of the Veil Nebula. These are, I would say, challenging visual objects. So you have to have a super dark sky, a, a you know, a good field of view. Maybe even a filter might help. Mm -hmm. I have trouble seeing the North American Nebula. I just don't think my eyes are red sensitive. What about you guys? Oh. Do, yeah, mm. do you guys, does it pop out for you? Under the right sky. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, yes. it, uh, the darker, the better, of course. And yeah, yeah that one uh, I enjoy looking at. Do you, do you use a wide field uh, refractor or do you use uh, binoculars? How do you look at it? Uh, for me, it's mostly my refractors. Uh, I don't yeah. even know if I've tried with my 12 by 36 binos on that one. Yeah. I really yes. have to convince myself that I can see it. <laughs> really? Yeah, huh. I don't know. I think I've got something weird. I had cataracts. I had surgery for cataracts, right? So I don't have my God-given eyes. I have these pieces of plastic mm. in my eyeballs. I don't know. Maybe they're not red trans. <laughs> maybe they're a red filter. I have no idea. Huh. Yeah. So, so I'm uh, like extremely red sensitive. Oh, wow. That's and, nice. And so uh, like seeing these kind of things, like I find like just even in like uh, – yeah. Unaided eye and binoculars. Wow. Um, yeah, I can see the North American nebula with so. So should any... we call you? Should we call you hydrogen alpha, Chris? From now on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. But Chris, yeah, like hydro... even, <laughs> even with just like the H beta filter, like on my fifty millimeter scope, I just yeah. love like panning around the whole sky, just just yeah. looking at all kinds of different uh, nebulae. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, Blair McDonald here. Uh, he he drives me crazy because like. We'll be out at St. Croix Observatory, and I'll be looking to see if I can see uh, North American Nebula. And then he'll go, he'll look at me, go, "Oh yeah, there it is." You know. <laughs> so I, I have no idea what other people see, but it's always a struggle for me. Mm. Now, th there's another interest. There's an interesting star in uh, in uh, Cygnus. There's a star called Gienna, and Gienna means wing. Mm -hmm. And and just keep that. Just note that, and it'll it, this will come up later in in the in the discussion. So mm -hmm. that's pretty much Cygnus. There's a lot of interesting things there. Uh, easy easy to find. It's like go out and look up the summer triangle. Even though it's the summer triangle, it hangs around quite a long time into the fall because it gets dark uh, earlier and earlier. Um, so for the people who are looking at the PDF, there's a couple of nice pictures by Dave Hoskin of uh, Alberio and Omicron 1 Cygni, if, looking to see what they they look like. Um, so the next constellation that I presented was Vulpecula, the fox. Now, I admit it's not a bird, but it's right next to Cygnus, and there's some really cool things in it. Um, and there's a, a bit of a surprise as well. Anyway, so I decided that because it was an observing oriented uh, discussion, uh, I wanted to keep Volpecula itself is a pretty hard to observe constellation. It's not very bright stars, but there's some really cool things in it. For instance, the coat hanger, which is a lovely open cluster, uh, Colander 399, and that's in the Explore the Universe. And it, I mean, it looks like a coat hanger. What I don't know is, Chris, do you know if that's an an actual cluster, like a physical association type cluster? I believe it is not. It is not. I believe it is not. I think some of the stars are associated, whereas I think like okay. a third of them are. Yeah. So I don't know. Are there a lot of the colander objects like that, they're just visual, you know, visual. A... Oh. Mishmash. Okay. Some are, some aren't. I guess from the observing point of view, probably doesn't, doesn't matter. Really matter. No. From the astronom astrophysics point of view, I guess they, they worry about whether these things are true clusters or not. I don't worry about those things. No. Anyway, it's a really neat thing to look at. Again, I'm a kind of a wide field object, eh, Shane? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. You can pick that out in binoculars easy, but it does look mm -hmm. cool in a, a wide field telescope. The um, The coat hanger? Yeah. You can see it from a from a really dark sky. You can see it unaided eye. I've done some sketches of yeah. it, and you can actually it's hazy, but you can you can see one or two of the brightest stars oh, in it. Yeah, I can pick it out as a smudge, and and you can actually see that it is a coat hanger. Like you oh, can yeah. actually 
yeah, you can actually kind of, the smudge is like a coat hanger shape. Like, you know, and, and to do this, this isn't uh, wander out from a bright house in, No, 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 no. You this have is to be, like you have fully to have. dark adapted, reclining Yeah. lawn chair, very comfortable, Relaxed. relaxed, Yeah. and Yeah. sort of like just sort of star hopping unaided eye for, uh, you know, an hour or two, you can do this, but this isn't a, uh, Uh, you know, jump out and then it's going to, you're just going to crane your neck back and see it. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Oh, say one tip for people looking for uh, the uh, coat hanger. Actually, I just reminded of it by looking at uh, this star chart. Uh, if you if you pick out the summer triangle or constellation Dave, if you like, uh, it's it's about one third of the way between Altair and Vega. So that's a good you know that's a good way to pick it out. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a nice it's it's right on the the it's right on the uh, perimeter of that triangle. So. That's, uh, in fact, how uh, Al Sufi described it in his, uh, was it the Book of Fixed Stars? I don't know, Al. Back <laughs> in, uh, back is in, he I think, is he out there in Regina too? no, no, I think, I think this was like in 965 Oh, oh, that AD, writing, Al. writing in Persia and the modern day Iraq, I think, yeah, something like that. So other people named Al, are they named after him? Like it was he the first guy named Al or I don't think he was the first guy. And it's the, it's the, uh, like you were saying, the, the, so what does Sufi mean? I, I was like, I was wondering that earlier. I should have looked, I should have looked it up, but yeah, he was a Persian astronomer. You just, Yeah. so you like dropping his name, but you have no idea what it means. Is that Well, what you're saying? I don't know everything. I mean, I'm just an amateur here. I'm just Okay. a bit I'm of a just, scratch. I'm a scratch I'm observer. yeah, I'm just uh, yanking your chain there. Okay, so the other cool thing in um, Vulpecula is M27, uh, which is kind of, it's if you can pick out Sagitta, which is just below it, which it actually looks like it's supposed to be as an arrow. Actually, Wait, wait, wait. You called it Sagitta? What about Sagitta? Sagitta. Sagitta. I, I call it Sagitta. Sagitta with a soft That's what G? I call it. Sagittarius, Yeah. like Sagitta. Okay. We do have, we actually have linguists who listen to the show and will chime in. They will write us I on have this. my observer's handbook here. There's a there's supposed to be a pronunciation guide. I've just been saying Sagita all my life. I always say Sagitta. Sagita. I'm gonna change to Sagita now. Sagita. I, I just go with the opposite of whatever somebody else is saying. It's it's like GIF. Anyhow. If you say GIF, I'll say GIF. <laughs> anyway, if you find if you find Sagita, dumbbells not far away. And uh It's also a third of the way between Altair and Denab, although not right on the line. It's a little bit inside the triangle, but if you're looking for it in binoculars or star hopping, that's where you find it. But you know, Dave, I had a bit of a bone to pick with you on About uh, on Volpecula. what's that? Well, you didn't want to include it in, in your notes. Well, but I, I haven't finished. Oh, okay, all right. Volpecula is not a bird, No, but but the name the name of Alpha Volpeculi. Is Anser, which means yeah, goose. used to be a separate constellation. What did the goose? Answer, yeah. Oh, I did not know that. I believe so. I believe that's the uh, that's the full history on it. Is that yeah it, that that star used to represent like part of a of a constellation, which is I believe in the mouth of the uh, Yes, Volpecula yes. the fox. Yeah, Well, if and. if you look at any of the old time. Uh, the old time constellation maps uh, before they became codified, people were making up all kinds of things. So, but you definitely see when they're illustrated, you can see the goose. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, I'm, I don't think there's an alpha of Velpucula. I don't think there's any beta, gamma, or any like the, anything like that. They're just all Weirdly numbers. enough, answer is alpha volpeculae. Yes, it is, mm. but there's no beta. that I can tell, uh, see or gamma or mm. just alpha. So it's like the, the, the stars are very dim. Maybe they only, is that Bayer? Maybe Bayer only gave uh, Greek letters to like the, the higher magnitude stars, but the other ones are extremely faint. Yeah. A little bit of a mixed bag there with bear. Yeah. Well, let's No, not dwell on Vulpecula. no, there's not much to see there I'm anyway. not sure. I'm not sure what, bone you were picking with me because I did get to the goose, didn't I? Ah, you did, but yeah, I thought you didn't want to include it in your notes because I wrote it. You're like, I'm not getting into that. That's too weedy. No, no, no. That was a nice, Okay. it was a find because I wasn't expecting it. That's not Oh, why, okay. that's not why I included it. But then I discovered it had a goose and I said, oh, great. Perfect.
let's move on to Aquila. How are we doing for time? Are we making good time here? Oh, uh, we're, no, we're making... about 30 minutes in, Dave. So okay. Lots okay. Of time. I have to, I have to. Okay. So Aquila, the Eagle, a very prominent constellation in the summer sky, particularly with its principal star, Altair. So Aquila, the Eagle. Now, uh, Aquila is a, a servant to the gods. Now, I've, I've come across this a few times. It seems like birds in Greek mythology were always servants. They were like couriers. Like They were like the FedEx of Mount Olympus. They, they were always sending these birds off to do different jobs, or Jason and the Argonauts. That'll come up with the dove. They were sending off birds to do little jobs for them. So Aquila was... Uh, a servant to the gods of Mount Olympus. Mm. And uh, uh, again, Zeus, uh, he he dispatched Aquila to to go off and uh, he, he's, he, he was an admirer of this uh, shepherd boy named Ganymede and uh, who was, was apparently a very attractive young man. And uh, he, he sent... Uh, Aquila to to abduct Ganymede and bringing him back to Olympus and he I guess he's immortal he's mortal but I guess he was kind of like their servant he became their servant and like the anyway um that's kind of a weird story but that's that's the Greek myths for you mm. um Ganymede you might want to follow that up I mean also Ganymede is also a uh, moon of Jupiter right moon of Jupiter yeah yeah, so there's something, there's more to the story than that, but we don't have time to get into it. Um, now, uh, so Altair and uh, Aquila are the only things in the story of the universe, and there's relatively few, um, there's not a lot of deep sky objects there. Um, so you can take issue with that. There's not much to look at. Um, the one, The one that catches my interest is bernard's e it's a dark nebula near aquila mm. uh the bernard e now i've again i've tried looking at this uh in a dark sky with binoculars and it's a fairly large object mm -hmm. uh, and you can convince yourself that it's there but it really shows up in photographs uh and it is in the dark nebula list in the RASC observer handbook um, mm -hmm. have have either of you guys observed bernard's e I think I think I have. <clears throat> I would have to check some of my notes, Chris. I'm yeah. sure you've looked at this many times. Oh, many, many, many times, many, many times. I discovered it before yeah. I before I knew what it was. But so uh, so uh, why isn't why isn't it uh, Beckett's E? I know, I know. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I ran I ran over it, and uh, but yeah, with binoculars from any reasonably dark site, I was even observing it when I was in Nova Scotia there. Uh, my yeah. First wow. night there, yeah. yeah. Had a good night and uh, took a look at it. It was awesome. Uh, you just need like those those really good high contrast nights when it's uh, both yeah. dark and and clear and yeah. uh, it's well placed you, away from any kind of uh, city glow. And and you have to stop looking at your cell phone like a, a good uh, half hour before. Okay? No yeah. looking at your cell phone. I don't look at my cell phone that much anyway. Um, <laughs> well, that's, uh, well, that's it. that's that's it for Aquila. Let's move on because the the next one is super interesting. I feel uh, there's so many. Just sec though. There's so many whoa, whoa. planetary nebulas in Aquila. There's lots. People should go look at them. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I see some here on the chart. Six, seven, eight, one, and there's a there's a galaxy. But I didn't. I don't really know those. They're not household names. I checked all these things to see if they were in in any of the observing lists. But like. I don't think any of them are in finest NGC or any of those things. So I think one is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I might have missed it then. But uh, okay. Um, I Paul Gray made a list of the dark nebula for the handbook, and uh, so we we put it in there. And uh, then I say, hey, hey, Paul, how come there's no magnitudes for these nebula? <laughs> <laughs> for which went, the what? dark nebula? Yeah. Why aren't there any magnitudes for the dark nebula? There are. There are? Yeah, there's opacity numbers. Opacity numbers. Oh, okay. Yeah, so instead of having magnitude, you have opacity. Opacity 6 is your most opaque, and opacity 1 is your least opaque. Yeah, okay. You'll okay. see them. He has them in there. Okay. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry. No worries. I, I was trying to make a joke with him. Oh. 
but, but, the, uh, that's, but he that's didn't have a good, he didn't go have ahead. a good comeback anyway <laughs> i'll have no, to no. look probably somebody edited that in he probably doesn't know they're there <laughs> could, be. could could be he observed them all yeah he's yeah. doing he's doing the uh uh the uh, what's it called? The challenge objects. Now he's sketching all the challenge objects with yeah, his. Yeah, because he's he's got Dave Lane's eighteen inch. Eh? I, I guess so. Yeah. 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 I was okay. Let's about it. let's get to the star of the show here. Lyra the harp. Th mm. This is pretty interesting. Why is Lyra in here? Well, okay. There's a bit of a story here. So Lyra is not just any old harp. Uh, it was made out of a turtle shell, and uh, and it was created by the god Hermes to you know to. He sort of invented the harp, but then he gifted it to Orpheus. Now there's a whole story about Orpheus and his playing of the harp and going to Hades. I'm not going to get into that, but the point is, is that Hermes gifted this harp that he created to Orpheus and he sent it to him by a bird. And the, uh, the stories about this, uh, it's hard to tell if they're talking about a vulture or another eagle, but in any in any case, it's always depicted as a bird with its kind of holding onto the harp with its wings folded as if it's diving, like mm. the falling bird or the falling or the diving vulture, something like that. I'm going to mm. get back to that. I'm going to get back to that. So, interestingly enough, the brightest star in Lyra is called Vega. And the best as I can figure out by reading all the literature is the the word Vega is refers to the bird, nothing to do with the harp. It's the bird, so it's like the swooping vulture, or the the falling the falling bird or the falling. And so that's obviously an uh, explore the universe. So interesting that the principal star in Lyra is named after a bird. And there's another named star in Lyra called Sheliac, Beta Lyra, and that means harp. Huh. So that's pretty cool that like the principal star is about the bird and the secondary star is about the harp, but the whole mm. constellation is a harp. So here's here's I want to throw this out to you, Chris. I seem to recall somewhere about Vega being referred to as the fallen yeah the fallen owing to the fact that it used to be almost the pole star of the yeah. of the entire heavens yeah. so is there a connection here this yeah. the fallen yeah but the fact that the, we have got a diving bird or a falling bird is it connected with that yeah. does it go back ancient ancient history yeah yeah, so I like I've kind of pieced this together. You won't find it all in one spot, but from what from what I understand, it's kind of like this. Okay, is that is that Lyra the harp fell and landed in the water, and then oh. the, e the eagle came down and grabbed it and brought it back up. And if you think about it, there's some really neat tie-ins there because when we think about the Milky Way, which is often seen as a river, yeah, yeah, right. So see the tie in like like I said this is just from what I've pieced together it was no, Zeus. I didn't I haven't heard this story. Yeah, so something like if you read some of the Greek mythology it's somehow it fell or something happened of course I'm sure somebody did something pretty heinous and then it fell from the sky into into the sea or the river. I think it was the river though and then the eagle. If we think about it eagles are diving birds which do fish in rivers and so there there's some some sense to this and it swooped down and grabbed it and then brought it up into the Milky Way, right? So yeah, well, river. I didn't I didn't come across that in my research yeah, that the river part in the of sky. It. That that's just my I could be completely off base here but that's uh, one of the things I've gleaned from from all the readings I've done. Anyhow, so Anyway, I think that's. I think I thought that was pretty cool when I was reading about this mm. and uh, the 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 eagle and like. So this is why Lyra gets honorable mention. It's not mm. a bird, but but it seems to involve a bird. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course, uh, there's lots of things to observe in in Lyra. I mean, Beta Lyra itself is a double star, and then there's Epsilon Lyra, the double double Zeta Delta. There's a couple of really cool Messier objects, M57, the ring. M56. Globular M56 cluster. globular cluster. Yeah, so that's a it's nice a one. very 
it's a very rich uh it's a very rich uh constellation for not being very big and by the way m56 is uh, just off of alberio so if you go from alberio to vega if you're star hopping you sh you, you should come across m56 uh, pretty easily so uh interesting constellation very interesting story uh and so i was thinking more about this idea of it of vega being an you you know being at one time a pole star or close to the pole and and it has fallen from the pole you mm -hmm. see what i mean yeah mm -hmm. so so it's, so some of this mythology may go back tens of thousands of years okay mm. oh We're for sure into yeah for sure it does look well, let's just move on uh uh, for those that are following in the um, uh, the the PDF file, I have a picture here from a 1729 a, um, illustrated uh, um, atlas of the sky by Reiner Otten, and it shows you know it shows Cygnus, it shows Lyra with, with, and and the ver vulture. It doesn't look like an eagle to me. It looks more like a vulture. But it it looks it's 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 even more like the the the, the lyre look the harp looks very small in this picture but and the, the, the vulture is quite big, and uh, Volpecular is there and Anser as you said Volpecula Anser. So yeah, so Volpecula and Anser, uh, like you said, Chris, they're they're sort of on an equal footing in this uh, mm. atlas. Mm -hmm. It's like there's one constellation and then there's another and. Uh, Sagita is there and uh, Aquila and and I don't know what's there's this crazy constellation in this uh, uh, Reiner Auten there's this guy looks like Cupid with a bow and they call oh him this Ant is Antinwa Antinwa Antinus yeah. yeah so this was the gay lover of Hadrian is this the Latin version of Ganymede uh, no, I don't believe so. This this was an actual real person. This this was, in in essence, Hadrian's lover, from what I uh, understand okay. in my reading of it. Yeah, and then um, but I there think seems that, but there seems to be a bit of a crossover with that Aquila. Story. There there does there does yeah. yeah. I think it's just a transposition, right, where they took one figure and then just matched it to see, the other. And see, see, back in those days, they you know. Everything went right. They were they, they they would draw. Everybody made up their own atlases mm. and they made up their own constellations and whatever you know whatever. Yeah. But whatever. But Anten them. Antinua was in there like sort of officially until the IAU uh, took it out. But it it was sort of in like most of the acceptable uh, charts. So Scutum is there and yeah, I guess yeah. you know I'm I'm seeing on this picture, uh, what's his name? The bull of what's his name? I see I see some uh, horns there. So th anyhow. I, I have a number of reproductions of Atlas's uh, books that I've picked up mm. over the years, and I went through them all. And to my astonishment, very many of them showed Lyra as a harp and a vulture. Mm -hmm. And so back in 1540, Appianus. In 1590, a guy named Hood. 1603, Bayer. Bayer. 1648, Blaui. 1661 Salarius, 1700 Allard, 1709 Van Kulen, then the Reiner Otten, 1729 Barlow in 1790, and 1801 Bode. And I could not find anything after 1801 that had the vulture in it, but all the ones before did. So there's an interesting something there, a mystery. Why did they drop the bird from the constellation in subsequent atlases? So... Mm. I feel we should move bit, on. Bit of a mixed metaphor, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so I just I'm wanna... looking here, though. You for, like there is one that. So, um, what was the guy's name? He he also has, he he's related to one of the uh, papal folks, but he had a predecessor to your Anemetria 1604, and then most people copied what uh, Bayer did. Okay. I'm tr I'm well, you, to... you have to. You have to understand that the, the the names that I gave here in years are just the ones that I happen to have in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I didn't go to any great length searching all the different. This is what I had in the house. Oh, do you, you have know. a copy of Bears? I have copies of. I have like 
prints that came out of calendars, like not complete. No, oh, okay. Not complete, but just stuff that I had that I hang hung on to. Mm. Let's let's move on. We got to talk about Corvus. Corvus the Crow is a Corvus is a spring constellation. Uh, not not a terribly prominent one, although it's kind of underneath um, Virgo. Uh, it's only prominent in the sense that there's not much else around it, but it it is it's fairly. It's not bright. But it's a fairly prominent, you know, in, in its own way, prominent little trapezoid as Corvus the Crow. And it's the unfaithful servant of Zeus. Zeus. Mm. Zeus. You say Zeus or Zeus? Anyway. Zeus. I would say Wasn't unfaithful. Wasn't it Dr. Zeus? Wasn't Dr. Zeus the one <laughs> in uh, Planet of the Zeus. Apes? <laughs> Zeus. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so why do I call him the unfaithful servant? Uh, Zeus sent the crow off to uh, collect some water. And uh, he had a, a vessel called Crater, which is the neighboring constellation. It's more of a drinking vessel rather than a cup. It's a kind of a bowl, Crater. Anyway, so he got distracted, stopped and ate a bunch of figs from a tree and was late coming back. And he lied about it. He said, oh, yeah, I got attacked by a snake, you know, and all this stuff. Anyway, Zeus saw through that. So he punished him. So it turns out the crow, Corvus, used to have this beautiful white feathery coat and had a beautiful song. And to punish Zeus, uh, punish him, Zeus took away, changed his feathers from white to black and took away his beautiful song and replaced it with its horrible caw. So that's how the crow got its color and song, okay? If you want to call it a song. Again, there's not a ton of stuff uh in Corvus, it's pretty low down, but the antennae galaxies, it's in the finest NGC, 403839. Uh, and Algorab, which is a uh, delta core of I, is in the RSE double star book. And the other interesting song uh, star here, there's a, here is, again, Gienna. Uh, but we already saw Gienna in um, Cygnus, so you can't I use that you can't have two stars of the same name. So typically, if you're referring to this star, you say Gienna Corvi. In other words, the wing of the crow. Gienna means wing. So this is the wing of the crow now. It's gamma, gamma Corvi. And for those people who are uh, fans of pop culture, the red dwarf star LHS 2520 is the star of the... Uh, planetary system, which includes the planet Krypton, which is home mm. to Superman. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I came across that, but it, I came across it. So, uh, the last one on this list is Columba the dove. Uh, I think it was named by Joanne Bode in Uranometria in 1801. Mm -hmm. And I get conflicting stories about this one. Uh, it could refer to the dove that was released by Jason, uh, uh, who was uh, traveling in his ship Argo Navis to to search for the Golden Fleece, and there was a, a dangerous uh, there was a dangerous channel he he needed to navigate through, and uh, so for some reason he released a dove to show him the way, something like that. Mm -hmm. So follow the dove. And if the dove gets through, we, we follow the dove, we'll get through. So but there's another story. Uh, someone someone tried to rewrite that story as the dove that was released by uh, Noah uh, from the ark after the flood. You know, the, 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 he goes off, the, the dove goes off and comes back holding an olive branch, uh, showing that the, the flood had subsided. Mm -hmm. There are no... In Columba, there are no RASC observing targets, zero, nada. Um, there is a black hole. Uh, I was really grasping at straws here, and there is an exoplanet uh, in that constellation. But in any case, it's a kind of a hard one to see. It's it's below Canis Major in the winter sky. Canis Major is already a ways down. So you have to have a good southern horizon, dark sky. Maybe people who live in the lower states maybe be able to pick that out. Where, so that's Columba. Columba, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it here, like um, driving south. And, okay. Uh, like 
70 K south of Regina. So right at a boat. Yeah. You know, 50 degrees north latitude or just okay. below on it. Like you need a really clear night and, you know, and yeah, it's yeah, usually exactly. cold that time of year. And cause but I want to, I, I wanted to hunt down uh, 1851. I think is the yes. 1851 there. is in there. Yeah. And then there's a galaxy. I couldn't see the galaxy, but I did see the globular. Yeah. Yeah, I did see well, the globular from here, but I, well, you're, I don't. You're you're a, you're a keener, Chris. Yeah. Anyways, it's it's no it's no surprise that the RASC doesn't have it in any of its lists. It's it's kind of far south. I mean, the poor people in Edmonton. You know, think of them, right? So <laughs> yes, those suckers. <laughs> I hope that, so that, that, that uh, kind Alistair's of finish, listening to this. That that kind of finishes the the main uh, the main uh, ten, I guess. Uh, uh, oh no, ten. I was oh, sorry. I'm I'm miscounting. It's, it's, those are the main ones. I think it's five um, that that we can see the the celestial birds that we can see from Canada. So the next ones, I'm going to go through these super quick. I've already mentioned them: Apis, Bird of Paradise, Pavo. Peacock, Tucana, Tucan, Grusse, the crane, Grus, Grusse, Phoenix. And it remains a homework assignment to see if the bird of paradise is actually a real bird. Uh, I'll have to check that out when, when I'm done. They're all pretty much all in the same sector of the sky. Uh, the way I listed them there, the ones that are closest to the South Pole and moving their way out. Grusse and Phoenix are about the same latitude, minus 50. Um. They're all like I've seen the southern sky, and they're all fairly obscure constellations, not terribly bright. Although, Pavo, I think Peacock is a navigation star. I think we talked about in Stars You Should Know, Peacock and Pavo. And I have, again, I have a, a, a from one of the, um, from one of my, um, reproduction atlases here i have a slide here with uh, pictures of those birds on it all together in one place i love those old atlases you know i love looking at them so i'm seeing who said was a pavo apis looks like apis might be no apis yeah the bird of paradise looks like it might be a real bird i'm going to check that out bird of paradise so i'm how much time we got left we're going to talk about these indigenous constellations Got some time got like left? five or six minutes, I think. Oh, wow. That, yeah. that few. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to go through these pretty quick. Um, I'm going to talk about Moon, the Moon Sky story super quick, mention some of the Cree constellations, and I'd like to spend uh, some time on the Wood Pigeon. Um, now, if, if you're interested in these kinds of constellations that are non IAU, I recommend you go to the RESC World Asterism Project because there's a ton of stuff there. I didn't have time to go through it all, but I just glanced through and I saw lots of, you know, there's lots of animals, birds, different things. Uh, so let me just t talk quickly about Moon and the Seven Bird Hunters. It's a very common uh, sky story here in Atlantic Canada. And Moon is the she-bear, which is the um, bowl of the dipper. And uh, in the story, she is pursued by seven hunters that are birds in the following order, Robin, Chickadee, and Grey Jay, which are the handle of the Big Dipper. And then you pop over to Booties, and you get the Passenger Pigeon, Blue Jay, Barred Owl, and Solwet Owl. Uh, and there's a link to that story uh, where you can uh, learn more about that. But uh, there's some there's some birds there for you. Uh I think I'm, it looks like I might have uh, jumped over. I, I uh, Okay, I'm just going to have a quick quick talk here about uh, Cygnus in the sky. The Cree see that as a goose, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And that's called Niska. And then there's a couple of the Thunderbirds, summer and winter Thunderbirds, uh, uh, Pinisu, okay? And this these come from the works of Wilfred Buck, the indigenous uh, star expert who was a recipient of the Kelak Award in 2023. So he's got a few books out that you should you could look up and maybe some videos. The, I picked those out as uh, examples of some Cree constellations. So the last one, uh, this is kind of a cool one. It's the Kereru, it's the wood pigeon of the Maori. And so 
if you've ever been to the Southern Hemisphere, you look up at Orion, you see Orion upside down. So you see the belt of Orion, and you see the sword of Orion up, and then Rigel is above the belt of Orion. So in in uh, New Zealand, uh, the um, the Maori see the three stars of the belt as a twig, and on that is perched a wood pigeon, um, Kereru, and uh, so they see. So the the Maori used to uh, bait these birds and and snare them. So they see uh, they see Orion's sword. What we see is Orion's sword as the snare, and Rigel is the bait. It's the berry of the for, for this activity, and uh, so they call that Puanga, and the rising of Rigel marks the. Uh, beginning of the Maori New Year. Some Maori use the um, Pleiades or Matariki, but others use Rigel, and it's about the same. The rising, the the, the rising of Rigel in the morning, and the rising of Matariki uh, or Pleiades marks the beginning of the New Year, and they have these big festivities. And so that's just a like a quick look at. Uh, some of the other uh, more indigenous bird constellations. Uh, obviously, one could delve into this much, much deeper. Um, so uh, I'll leave it there. So awesome. Have, have any comments or, or questions about that? Nothing I for do. me. <clears throat> I, I do. Okay. I, I do have a comment and a question all in one, actually, because we, we don't have much time left. But No, thank when, goodness. When, <laughs> when you were, I gotta talk. Um, when you were uh, doing all this, did you did you notice that at least in the northern hemisphere, that many of the bird type constellations are in areas of the sky that are very rich, um, or at least crossing over the Milky Way. Um. <clears throat> well, certainly. The first three I mentioned, which are the Summer Triangle, are definitely among, you know, up there in the Milky Way or um, straddling the Milky Way. Cygnus is right in it. Mm. Altair's to one side and Vega's, Lyra's a bit to one side. But yeah, I noticed that. Um, what's uh, did, did you see some significance in that? Well, just that I was wondering if if uh, sort of in in the ancient history, if people had placed these um these constellations not coincidentally as birds where the milky way passes through in uh -huh. essence because of the uh, sort of feathery perhaps nature as as they may have seen it of course there's some conjecture on my part but just just the thought that the milky way can have sort of a feathering uh appearance to it and it, it made me wonder if if that's why many of, if if not all of the Northern Hemisphere uh, bird type constellations or aviary constellations are placed along the Milky Way. Like it seems oddly coincidental. Well, I guess so. There's not really enough of them to really make a statistical comment. Like mm. when you say most or all, I mean, we're only talking about a half a dozen, right? That's true. So, you know, maybe it's just a coincidence, but, yeah. but, you know, Cygnus is definitely along the Milky Way. I mean, and, and Swan is a water bird. Mm -hmm. um, Ants air looks like it's pretty much in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Lyra's to one side and Aquila, I I guess. Yeah. I, I guess that's a Milky Way goes through it. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, it's just, it, like I said, it's a bit I of a comment, a bit of know, a question. I guess what I'd like to say is is that there's always room for more research on constellations and their meaning and their origin. Every time I look at something, I learn something new. I learned something today from you about uh, about the uh, the falling bird. I didn't. I never heard the story about it retrieving. Maybe I could be misremembering. I feel like I don't think you would make something like that up. It seems like a strange thing to make up, though, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't sit around thinking about this enough, but it's cool. Well, thanks so much for doing this, Dave. Well, uh, it was fun. Thanks for having me on.
Yeah, this was great, Dave. Always, always insightful and always enjoy your presentations. It'd be interesting to see what people's comments might be on, on this material. And we're going to put this uh, presentation, this PDF up in the Dropbox or up the Dropbox link up in our show notes oh, or something, Shane. I think I can put the file itself uh, okay. so people can just download it off of actualastronomy.com. I think oh. that would be best because I, I don't, I can't guarantee that it'll always be a Dropbox. Mm. And for people in the future who are going back, they might be disappointed if they can't find it. Cool. Well, thanks again. And uh, to our listeners, please subscribe, share the show with other stargazers you know, and send us your show ideas, observations, and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>